and she's awesome. I mean, I, I would be working with her if she wasn't my wife, but yeah, luckily she's my wife. And, you know, we were, we were together for three years before we made life after bath together. Uh, I think. Tuscan Growth has a program where they take all the top managers to Italy. Amber, pack your bags. What? You're going to Italy. I have a feeling you're going to fall in love. OK, I was kind of thinking that, too. Hi, Jim. Jeff, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I like your art in the background. A lot better than by me, you know? <laughs> you got some cool stuff. You got that neon sign and... I got Mandy Rose. That's a that's my uh, that's a wrestler. It's actually a personalized autograph too, so it's like a big deal for me. I had it in the bedroom, but as you know, it didn't work out very well, so I had to move it to the living room. Why didn't it work out very well? Because I would get comments. You know, I'm a single guy, and they like, um, why is there a cardboard cutout of a girl in your room? That was the question I would get. Damn. Yeah. Or they Multiple wouldn't realize times. it because it was tucked away in a corner at some point. Like, wait, is that like a chick cardboard thing? I'm like, yeah, it is. So. Sounds least, pretty wild, man. <laughs> yeah, there's some stories there, Jeff, <laughs> before that. So at least she covers up the cords for my, you know, neon sign. So it looks, it looks better. <laughs> so it's like a double whammy. That's great. There you go. <laughs> you know, trying yeah. to be productive. Well, you know what? Also, I, I need to know before we get started with everything, um, Tuscan Grove, bottom, bottomless breadsticks or no? Do, are you asking if they do have bottomless breadsticks? Yeah, yeah. Are we, like that's that's a big decider there. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Yeah, it's. I think it's uh, all you can eat pasta is sort of their move, but I'm sure you can finagle bottomless breadsticks as well if that's your thing. It's well, a lot of carbs, but yeah, that's that's the selling point in that case. So I guess yeah, I guess it is. Also, you know, as, as a single guy, you made me feel a lot worse about myself knowing that, like, oh, in order to like score a good looking girl, I need to have a boat and be a pasta king, apparently, to to, to get attention. You know, I mean, it sounds like you're doing all right. It's just the <laughs> the poster is the only thing standing in your way. But... I guess that's a good point too. I'll, I'll go for dating yeah. advice with you. I mean, simple yeah. but effective. <laughs> yeah. I've seen, I think all of your films from, from like Joshi, Horse Girl, um, Life After, but I've, I've seen it all. Like it, it's funny because Little Hours, I think you premiered it in Chicago here at the Music Box Theater. Um, mm -hmm. And I was there for that too. So that was back in the day, but I'm like, I, I've seen everything. I just, it's hard to believe sometimes you, you have like only like 10 movies done. I'm like, wait, I think I've seen everything. I thought like, there's a lot more going, <laughs> but but you're selective in a sense since like, I guess you got started first writing with I Heart the Huckabees, right? With David O. Russell. I did. Yeah. That was my first uh, credit as a writer. Uh -huh. And then probably for like uh, eight years or so, I just started. Um, yeah. What happened in that eight years? Because I was wondering, and then you start hitting up <laughs> like one after another. I was just doing, you know, studio writing jobs, like either originals or rewrites and stuff. And, you know, it was like a good way to make money. And it was sort of like the, there was like an inflection point a little bit after that, where it was easier to make independent films. But before that, it felt like um, the goal was to try to get those, because you know, there used to be like mini major studios, like yeah. um, Warner's Independent. And the, those places were sort of the the places you would try to make the movies that I'm making now at. And, uh, you know, back in like 2003, I was trying to get Life After Beth made and we got pretty far with Searchlight and then it kind of fell apart. And so I just kind of got stuck in writing. And, you know, I think it was, it was like financially great. It was lucrative, but um, ultimately I wanted to be directing. And my friend, Mike Zakin, who ran American Zoetrope mm -hmm. told me, hey, there's this like opportunity to get a tax credit in LA and, you know, we can get I don't know, it was like 30 or something percent off the budget if we make a movie and, you know, why don't we try to do that? Do you have any ideas? And ultimately I wanted to make Joshi at the time. And that was my idea. And Adam Pally's mom passed away, unfortunately. So we've kind of put a pin in it, but then I had that script for life after Beth, like in the bag, because I initially was trying to make it and never even like thought about it, but Aubrey's agent brought it up. And so, and she was like perfect for it. So we just, you know, at the last second pivoted and made that, you know, it was, it, it honestly wasn't the intention, but we kind of jumped, jumped on it when we had the chance. Cause we got this tax credit. So crazy. Yeah. So One for eight years, I was just writing. 
Yeah, but you know what? That kind of gave you that time too to write and have some ideas, have things in place for now when when it started hitting off, you know, you had all these ideas and scripts ready to go mm-hmm. too, you know? So it's in a sense that prepared you. That was like kind of that that practice before the game, you know, in a sense. Definitely. And I think, you know, the that time, you know, it was also decompressing and kind of getting to a place where I felt like I could be directing again. So, um, yeah, but I mean, I was busy. I just wasn't directing. And then I think since I made my first movie, I've been just trying to jam them out because I have so many ideas that I want to make. And I feel like you got to strike while the, you know, the iron's hot. So, no I've question. Been, yeah. Also, just like real quick shout out to the Music Box Theater. That's like my favorite theater in the country. I love really? that so much. Yeah, I love it. It's classic, it's right? For those that don't know, it's in, it's in Chicago. It's a really old school curtains orchestra. Super it's like cool. A bijou. Yeah, it's like a bijou theater. It's just gorgeous. The sound's good. Picture's good. It's The audience is great. I feel like, you know, Chicago audiences are incredible and they're all really smart and have good taste and are cultured. So, yeah, it's it's. I wish there were more theaters like that. Unfortunately, there aren't. Yeah, it's a classic for sure. You know, the look of it, even the concessions when you walk in, it's small, kind of off the city street, you know, but it, it, inside it's ginormous. The, the the auditorium is huge, but yeah, it's it's yeah. unlike anything. You know, we have these major cineplexes now, but it's so cool to have a sort of a classic old school movie feel too. And and I'm glad that they, they constantly run stuff every week, new stuff, older stuff, remastered stuff. I go there all the time. Yeah, they show great stuff. I mean, they, they have great taste. Whoever, whoever is the programmer is amazing. The Chicago critics. It's a lot of film, film critics. Festival it's, actually, great. it's the yeah. film critics in Chicago. They're the programmers there too. So they work there too. A few of them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I it's, love it there. Yeah, so it's was great to have you for a little hours there too, uh, you know, uh, for, for that premiere. I know it was during the Critics Festival. I remember years back and it was like the highlight film. So, uh, you know, it, it kind of, you know, I, I've been familiar with your work for like I mentioned for a long time. You've done so many cool, like eccentric things and just different offbeat sort of comedies and then dramas too. Uh, do you feel like now, you know, especially with maybe streaming, I don't know if that helps too with more options that you're, you're able to do sort of the films you want to do, it seems like, you know, and you have your group of, of actors that are probably recognizable in every film of yours. Uh, do you feel like that is in a sense, like a, the dream for the writer slash filmmaker way make movies, make it with friends and people you, you trust and know, and, you know, to be able to, to do what you do in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, for the most part, I've been lucky enough to not have a lot of interference creatively. So I've been able to express myself the way I intended. I think that's pretty rare. I think, I mean, I'm hoping independent film is rebounding and there's going to be more opportunities for other filmmakers to make movies. And there's going to be more opportunities for venues to show those movies. Um, you know, television and, you know, superhero movies are looming so large and sucking up, you know, unique voices and kind of forcing them into the machine. And, you know, I think, I think it is rare to be able to have as many opportunities as I've had. I've been lucky and um, I'm definitely appreciative of that and hope to have more opportunities, but yeah, I mean, I, I love movies and I love filmmaking and I just celebrate it. And I just hope, you know, younger filmmakers and newer filmmakers just also have a chance to kind of express themselves because I don't know I think there there's definitely a dearth of interesting new movies and I'm hoping that that is a trend that's going in the other direction yeah and I think stuff's more accessible too these days you know 10 years ago we couldn't we wouldn't watch foreign movies because oh the the subtitles or the access wasn't there and now just so much more access to to various sort of films and uh different uh, you know, genres and, and yeah, stuff we would be kind of close minded to before. I think we've really kind of matured as moviegoers in a sense and, and accepted a lot of things that we were turned off by initially, you know, just even a decade ago or so. Do you think like in the last 10 years, people are more accepting of foreign films? No, no question. I, I think the cinephiles always had the love for it and would find a way mm-hmm. to seek him out for a casual moviegoer. It would be tough to find a great, in a sense, Japanese movie or, you know, a, a Norwegian movie or sort of thing like that. You know, maybe you have to go to like a library in a sense that that'd be a spot to find it. But um, now I feel like, you know, with the streaming you can find them so much quicker and they're 
they're accessible a lot more than I feel like I watch a lot of foreign stuff too. So uh, yeah, 10 years ago, no way I would get the access or I'd have to dig deep to search it than I would now. Oh, well, that's wild. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I've always been drawn to foreign movies. Those are my favorites. So mm -hmm. not that it's a genre, but you know, the reason I became a filmmaker is because of Fellini. When I was a kid, I saw Eight and a Half. And I think that impulse to, you know, watch as much as I can, that was interesting and new sort of forces you into sort of more auteur driven filmmaking, which I think is primarily European. And so, uh, you know, like there's definitely tons of great American filmmakers, but I've always been drawn to like foreign films. And, you know, I, I worked in a video store when I was in high school. Me and, too. I work at a blockbuster, you know, back when you were around. Uh, yeah. I worked at a place called Specs, which I don't think exists anymore in Miami. And the guy who like ran it had really good taste. And I was also really lucky. I had a teacher in high school who um, we started like a, a, a film club basically. And we would go see like Kozlowski movies and stuff. And, you know, he turned me on to some really great stuff. Like I remember he gave me a copy of Blow Up. And, uh, yeah, Blow Up, the um, Antonioni movie. And I was like in 11th grade. And I don't know, he showed me like really weird stuff like uh, Superstar, the Todd Haynes movie. And oh, wow. so I think like I was lucky um, that I was pointed in the right direction when I was a kid. And I also had like uh, Encore back in the day on cable, like I had TV in my room. So mm -hmm. I, I got to watch like a lot of like Robert Altman movies and Michael Ritchie movies and just got to see a lot of weird campy stuff and like Joe Bob Briggs' drive-in theater. So I think I was always drawn to like, you know, the sort of left of center things. And I felt like always had an opportunity to see it, you know, even bef you know between video stores and, you know, weirdo cable TV, like a night flight always had some weird stuff on it when I was a kid. So I think there was always, I think, you know, it, if you seek it out, it was there, but maybe yeah. now it's just like, you don't even have to seek it out. It's like forced on you. Yeah. It would just come to you on Netflix in a sense. It would just pop up. Oh, it's a foreign movie right away. in your top picks, you know, even if it's not like in your queue or whatnot. So I feel like it just, we, we see it now it come across mm -hmm. for us and not seek it out, you know, in, in that way. I had to ask you like this film takes place in Italy. Little hours, I think was taking place in Italy too. And I don't know if you filmed it there, but this one clearly yeah. was there. Have you have an affinity <laughs> with Italy? Like what's the romance with you with Italy in, in a sense that you've been able, and fortunately been able to film there too, which is super cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the original story for the little hours, I, you know, I read, I read the Decameron when I was in college. So I always had that in the back of my mind as something I wanted to make and shooting in Italy was a function of making that movie specifically. I'd only been in Italy twice before that. And of course, loved it. But having shot there, it's like you're living there. And so you feel really ingrained in the culture. And then we would take you know, trips to different areas. And Italy just blows my mind with how amazing it is. All Anywhere you go, every region, every city is different. The cuisine and the culture and the people are just so lovely. And I can't get enough of it. And I feel like every time I go back, I find something new, even in places I've been before. Just it's it blows my mind. And so I definitely was eager to get back there and work again, which is sort of the impetus for making this movie. Um, but like in the interim between making the little hours and now, I did the 23 and me 23 and me test. And yeah, yeah. my dad did it and we, you know, we found out my dad's like a quarter Italian and we didn't even know that. So there's definitely something in the blood probably, but to me, Italy is just one of the most fantastic countries. I mean Spain's great, France is great, like can't get enough of either one of those, but there's something specifically about Italy that I'm drawn to. And you know, like I said, Fellini is the reason why I became a director. So there, there's something kind of like inherently connected to Italy and filmmaking for me. And it looks beautiful on camera. You know, you don't have to include any yeah. see lenses or anything. The, the, the landscape and the colors sell itself, you know, in a lot of ways, especially the seaside town is just unbelievable. Oh, for sure. And that's sort of like, you know, one of the things that we did in this movie was, you know, the expectation is it's just going to be lots of beautiful shots of Italy. And you know, sort of thematically, we went the opposite direction where we kind of, you know, the majority of the movie takes place in this like run down, dilapidated, um, like hotel that like kind of sucks. And so you feel kind of trapped and you're, you're like yearning to see more of this, you know, Tuscan countryside and we're withholding it, you know, intentionally. So that that tension to me is is kind of fun too, where it's like, you're expecting this trip to be something that's like, mind-blowing and beautiful and you're kind of like left with living in a dank dorm 
<laughs> hey, it, it all looks good. I, I mean, I love the crews you always put together. You get to work with your wife, which is super cool. I mean, not many people can say that too. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, that's a heck of an experience to going to work and then, you know, <laughs> then you get to go home together too. So. Yeah. I mean, she's awesome. I mean, I, I would be working with her if she wasn't my wife, but yeah, luckily she's my wife and you know, we were, we were together for three years before we made life after bath together. Uh, I think, I think having that sort of shorthand and that sort mm -hmm. of connection, like, you know, it's, it's amazing. There's like a, you know, there's a handful of directors who have been lucky enough to be with an amazingly talented performer. I mean, Fellini with like Julieta Messina. Um, but like the, the sort of opportunities to create together and do something creative where we're both fulfilled. It's like, how rare is that? And she's down and she's so talented. So I'm really lucky. Well, I think I'm going to be talking tomorrow with her on the Emily, the criminal press day too. So it's a nice, <laughs> nice turnaround with talking to both. Yeah. Of so, uh, That's fun. A keep on doing great work. Been a long time fan of yours. Uh, I always know I'm in interest in for an interesting treat when I see your film. So uh, keep on doing great work, Jeff. And I love that you keep on bringing back the people that you get to work with always, because uh, you, you got a heck of a talented uh, crew always of actors. So uh, much Thanks, luck Jim. and keep on doing your work. You too. Good luck with uh, your poster and your life. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll need a real life version, you know, of a girlfriend. That, that'd be that'd be progress. You know, hopefully on the next one, I can update you that I've been on a successful date. But <laughs> yeah, keep me put. I want to hear uh, all the details about your dates. So that'd be fun. <laughs> Sounds good, Jeff. Great catching up with you. I'll talk to you on the next one. All right. Take it easy, man. All right. Bye bye. Bye.